Well, hello. Thanks for joining me. Today we're going to talk about how to find the formula of a hydrate, something that's done in the lab. Now there's some vocabulary words I'd like you to be familiar with, so I'm going to go through those before we begin. The first word is hydrate, and I'm sure when you see the word hydrate, it reminds you of the word dehydrated. Dehydrated means without water, so hydrate means with water. Specifically, what we're talking about is a chemically a salt that has water attached to it. So when I say salt, I generically mean a metal, non-metal combination. And then this little dot means attached to it. Okay, It's not chemically bonded, it's just attached to it. So your clothes are attached to your body. They're not really part of your body. And this X could be some number. So here's kind of a, a, an odd example. It's called calcium sulfate hemihydrate. Now, what it says is for every one calcium sulfate, there's a half a water molecule. Now you're like, that's crazy. You can't have a half a water molecule. And I agree. What it really would be is one water molecule shared between two calcium sulfates. But the way we write these, it's always this salt, one salt, and then how many waters. Generally, this number X here will be a whole number, like one, two, three, four, five, six, some number. And it can be saturated, kind of like a sponge, only holds so much water. And we'll figure that out, how much water it can hold. Now, the word anhydrous means without, that's what an in front means, without water. So if you were to take, let's say, this hydrate, mn.xh2o, and then this triangle means to heat it up. So we're going to heat up this substance that has water in it. Now, I didn't mention this, but it probably looks and feels dry to you, even though there's water trapped inside of it. And when you heat that up, you drive off the water, and you're left with the MN. The MN is the anhydrous salt. Now, if you heat this too quickly with the water inside, it pops, and the water kind of explodes off of there as it changes from a liquid to a gas. I think of it as, well, it's actually the same thing as how popcorn pops. You have a popcorn kernel that has water inside, and when you heat it up, the liquid water changes from liquid to a gas, expanding its volume, and the little kernel goes, and it pops. Perhaps you've done that lab in, uh, in biology where you dry out popcorn seeds by leaving them in an oven without boiling it, so it's like a 180 degree oven or 200 degrees oven for several hours, and then you use an air popper and you realize the kernels just won't pop because the popcorn seeds are dry. Or conversely, you can soak the seeds in water overnight, then let them dry out, and they will all pop, although they have kind of a, a funny texture to it. So old popcorn, when it dries out, just doesn't pop anymore. Now decrepitation, you do have to be careful of. In the lab, when you're heating your substance, if you heat it too rapidly at the beginning, it will start to pop and you will have dust all over near your beaker, and that's really part of the salt that you want to be keeping in there. Um, if that happens, you simply remove the item from the hot plate, and the popping stops, then you heat a little bit more gently the next time. Now, these other two words are just words that we sort of think of. Hygroscopic is, means a substance that can absorb water readily, so absorbs moisture readily from its surroundings. Think about in the old days, cell phones were not waterproof. And if you dropped your cell phone in water, if you got it out quick enough, you might be able to put it in some uncooked dry rice. And the rice is a hygroscopic substance that would absorb the water from the phone, and maybe your phone would still be okay. Um, oftentimes, you'll go to a restaurant, and if they have a salt shaker on the table, oftentimes it will have... Well, it looks, it's uncooked rice inside the salt shaker. And what that is to do is to absorb the moisture so the salt doesn't clump and it flows smoothly. Other times they can add chemicals to do that, but uh, a lot of times they'll just add rice. It's a very hygroscopic substance. Now, some chemicals have to be stored um, without water, like sodium, potassium, because in water they can explode. So a desiccant is a material that absorbs water readily. It's a drying agent. Now, a desiccant would be placed in this glass jar thing called a desiccator. It's got a sealed glass lid. In class, I'll show you what it looks like and explain a little more. 
A desiccant you'd be familiar with might be something like this. If you see silica gel, oftentimes you'll see this when you buy an electronic item or a leather item. Um, and what it does is keep the moisture from drying out the leather or somehow corroding the circuits in your electronic item. Okay, so those are some vocabulary terms associated with hydrates. Now, I'm showing you a hydrate here. Um, this in the test tube that the cursor is going over is copper sulfate pentahydrate. So it looks like dry blue crystals and there's water attached. Now, when you heat this up, that's what I'm doing over here on the right side. When you put that test tube in there, it changes from blue to white. Now, what you can't see in the still photo is there's actually steam coming out of the test tube. So what we're doing is going from a hydrate, that's the water attached over here, and the white powder is an anhydrous salt of copper sulfate. So it says here, a hydrate is an ionic compound metal, non-metal, like copper sulfate, that contains a specific ratio of water loosely bound to it. That's the waters of hydration. And we can remove it by hydration, by heating. We can also, once it's dehydrated or anhydrous, we can add water back to it. So it's reversible. So the only way that a anhydrous and a hydrate differ are just by the waters attached to them. But it says here, compounds that differ only in the numbers of water can have very different properties. Okay, you can just see color alone. This one's blue. This one's white. Now, uh, let's see what we've got going on here. If we were doing this as a lab, and we may do this as a lab later in the year. Um, it just depends if you guys are back in school. Um, I have here barium chloride trihydrate. And you can see here, there are three waters. There's an H2O on the top, H2O over on the left, H2O on the right, and here's my barium chloride. And notice that the chlorine is bonding, attracting to the polar positive part of the waters, and the barium <coughs> being positively charged is attracting to the polar negative of the oxygen, and it can only hold three waters. Now, in the lab, what you'd be doing is you'd be given an unknown hydrate and have to figure out the formula. So I'm going to kind of walk you through that and then we'll see if this makes some sense. The first thing you do is you grab a beaker and you would weigh it to record the beaker that you're going to be using in your experiment. And I recorded my mass 47.28 grams. Then you're going to take the sample before heating, that would be the hydrate, and you're going to add a spoonful into the beaker. And that now weighs, the weight went up to 53.84 grams. So now what's in there? Well, you got the beaker plus the salt plus the water because salt and water is the hydrate. You then heat the sample and continue heating it and continue heating it until the weight no longer decreases. When the weight no longer decreases, all the water is gone. Now, you're not going to be able to heat it long enough to even melt the salt let alone get it to turn to a gas and disappear. So you really can't overheat the sample. So we heated it, we weighed it, we heated it, we weighed it, and we found that the weight did not drop any further. And so that at that point, we know all the water's gone. It's not always going to be a color change. So you heat to constant weight. So now the only thing we have is the beaker plus the anhydrous salt. Now, you're given one other bit of information. You're given the molar mass of the anhydrous salt. The teacher would have given this, and that will help you find the formula of a hydrate. Now, that data would have taken you probably most of the period to gather, and then you would have been working on processing your data. So we're going to do that together as well. We're going to kind of expedite this whole little operation, and hopefully you'll get something out of it. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do here, I label these A, B, C, D, so I can just talk about them a little bit. If I want to determine the mass of the hydrate, how much I added, I'm simply going to take B, beaker plus salt plus water, minus A. And when I do that, I get 6.56 grams. That is the mass of the hydrate. So I simply took beaker plus hydrate minus beaker. And I could even add that number to the data table, 6.56 grams. That's how much salt 
plus the water that was in there originally. That's called the hydrate. Next, I want to determine the mass of the anhydrous salt. Now you're like, isn't that 6.56 grams? No, no it's not. The anhydrous salt is just the MN. Now, if I remember my letter, A, B, C, D, and an E, I suppose, if you took C minus A, beaker plus anhydrous minus beaker, I think you'd be there. So we can do that. So 51.84 minus 47.28, that means the anhydrous salt is 4.56 grams. Now, the formula of the hydrate, remember a chemical formula is a mole ratio, not a gram ratio. So our next step, much like when we made the empirical formula, is to convert grams into moles. So I know the, the anhydrous salt, what it weighs, and I know the molar mass of the anhydrous salt. So if I took 4.56 and then divide that by 128 grams per mole, I can figure out how many moles of the anhydrous salt I have. Now I also need to know the moles of water, and that means I need to know the grams of water. Now, if the hydrate is salt plus water and the anhydrous is salt, if I simply subtract those two, that's how much water I have. So, to determine the mass of the water, I could simply take the difference between these two numbers right here, the 6.56 and the 4.56. Likewise, I could take the difference between the 53.84 and the 51.84. In both cases, it's the same thing, you'll get two grams of water, okay? And I'll go ahead and add that to my data table. There's two grams of water as well. Let me just add that on there, 2.00 grams of water. Okay, now from here, I'm getting very close to having what I need done, the formula of the hydrate. So at this point, it says, formula of a hydrate, step one, convert grams to moles of the salt. Well, remember, we had 4.56 grams of salt. And we were given in the question, the molar mass of anhydrous is 128 grams per mole. We got 4.56 grams. So I simply took the 4.56 divided by 128 and got the number of moles of MN. Again, I would like to see this to at least three sig figs, maybe four decimals. Now do the same thing for water. Now if we go back up here, remember we have two grams of water. In water, I hope you remember or can figure out H2O. Oxygen weighs 16, each hydrogen weighs 1, so that's 18 grams per mole. So on the second step, I simply took my two grams of water, I know that for every one mole of water is 18 grams, so 2 divided by 18 is 0.111 moles of water. Now I have a ratio of moles of salt to moles of water. And much like in an empirical formula, you divide by the smaller number of moles, in this case divide both by 0 0.0356 moles. And I get a 1, and a little bit bigger than a 3, 3.12. Now, at this point, you have a choice to make. You can say that's a 1 to 3 ratio with some experimental error. That's probably what I would do. And I would write the formula MN.3H2O. Now, the other way to think about it is, well, if you're absolutely sure you have it right, there was probably 4 moles of water, and you were kind of halfway between 4 and 3, and it was dropping down as you were drying it out. So, it really depends how confident you are in your sample, how dry you had it. But this is in essence how they find the formula of a hydrate, just going through this process. All right, so if we were in class, what you would do is you would weigh a dry beaker, then you would add a spoonful of the hydrate, that's the salt plus the water, into your beaker and record that's mass. Then you would go over and you'd heat it, and you'd heat it for about 10 minutes, Low it first for the first three minutes to drive off some of the water because if you heat it on high right from the beginning, you can cause decrepitation, that popping. And then you continue to heat it on high for an additional about seven minutes. Then you go ahead and let it cool and then you weigh it and then you heat it again.
for maybe another five to seven minutes. You cool and weigh it. Now, if your weight in step six and your weight in step four are the same, you're done heating. If it's not, guess what? You have to go back and heat it again and reweigh it until you get a constant weight, until you get the same mass. Then you know all the water's gone. Once you do that, you're done, and then you just do the lab. Now, the lab we do actually is, the, the compound I give you is Epsom salt. It's magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. And so there's a lot of water in there. It's 51.2% water, yet it looks absolutely dry. All right. This is showing maybe a, a traditional way that would be done instead of a beaker. If you remember, this is called a crucible and lid with a clay triangle on an iron ring on a ring stand with a meeker burner. And uh, this method works well. The crucibles are made of a ceramic material, much like you'd use in a baking dish. They can handle very, very, very high heats. Um, I don't particularly enjoy having students use these when they use the, these tongs down here, the crucible tongs. They oftentimes drop the hot uh, crucible, or worse yet, and it, and it breaks, or worse yet, they hold it over their hand and they drop it on their hand and they burn their hand then scream profanity and drop it and break it anyway. So I found that working with beakers for me generally works just fine. Um, there could be some other questions that we would ask, but hey, you know what? That is formula of a hydrate. So thanks for listening. Um, I wish we were doing this as a lab, but again, with so many students missing from class, you know, some of us would have a chance to do this and the rest of us would be sitting at home kind of waiting for something to happen. All right. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day. Bye.